Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to give this just a minute or so um, so that people can get logged in. Um, we'll start about one minute. All right, looks like everyone is logging in quick and fast this morning. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Lady Jennings Hall. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager here at DRA. I will be your host and moderator. And thank you for joining us for today's session, Understanding the Americans with Disability Act, or ADA. We here at DRA are proud to support the Americans with Disability Act on its 32nd anniversary. So let's celebrate this important civil rights law that it works to ensure all people with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else. I do have a couple of housekeeping notes to go over before we get started. This is a webinar, so if you haven't already noticed, your video and audio are automatically turned off for the duration of this webinar. If you do have questions, please ask them. Just drop them in the Q&A option below. We'll answer questions throughout the presentation as well as at the end. And we do ask to help us keep the session as accessible as possible. <coughs> Excuse me. By limiting chat posts to substantive questions and comments. Please use the private message feature to say hello to friends or side conversations. This will ensure that our attendees using screen readers will be able to hear the speakers as everything posted in the chat pane is read aloud by the screen reader. If you need technical or event related assistance, just directly chat me. My screen name reads DRA moderator. I'll be available to help you with anything. This session is recorded and it will be available along with all the resources shortly after. If you need, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, I'm getting over a cold. If you need closed captioning, there is a CC option at the bottom of the screen and I'll drop a link in the chat as well. Today, I'm gonna to introduce our speaker. His name is Thomas Nichols. He's got a great presentation for us today. So I am gonna turn it on over to him. Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> thank you and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we are here to talk about uh, just kind of some basics uh, on the ADA. There's so much to cover, so much that we could talk about. Uh, I've got the enormous slide deck that there is absolutely no way that we're going to be able to power through even if we had two hours to go over everything. But we're going to try to fit in as much as possible. Um, to start off with, uh, we are we are Disability Rights Arkansas. Um, we are uh, the state of Arkansas's protection and advocacy system. Uh, our mission is to vigorously advocate for and enforce the legal rights of people with disabilities in the state of Arkansas. Uh, we and our organizations that are like us are established by federal law uh, to exist in all 57 states and territories in the United States. And as part of uh, those federal laws, uh, governors are required if they receive certain federal funds to assure Congress that we are in existence and that we, uh, we are active in fulfilling our mandate and our mission. What do we do? We provide, in short, uh, legal, uh, legal representation and advocacy to individuals with disabilities uh, based on approved priorities that are set uh, by our board after public comment is, is considered. Uh, they set our priorities at the beginning of every year. And uh, with that said, we do not accept all cases about all issues that are uh, that are facing individuals with disabilities, but we always, always request public comment through uh, surveys before the start of every fiscal year. Our priorities this year uh, are, uh, in, in an abbreviated sense, abuse, neglect, and exploitation, education and employment in integrated settings, institutionalization of youth, uh, Medicaid services, including those who are eligible for past services, which is uh, our state's uh, developmental disabilities waiver and, uh, and services for individuals uh, with behavioral health and mental health needs. 
Uh, voting is always a priority. We have a specific grant that is just for voting. Uh, and then our final priority is self-advocacy, and that could be everything from teaching individuals how to advocate on behalf of themselves, uh, but also helping individuals with decision-making through assistance uh, with seeking alternatives to full uh, guardianship. So let's just dig right into the ADA. Um, it is a federal civil rights law. Uh, it was passed in 1990 to remedy disparate treatment of individuals with disabilities and to ensure equal access to all parts of life. Though it's been divided into uh, five separate titles, uh, it, uh, each one of them uh, takes a part of public life and even private life and is designed to uh, expand access to ensure people with disabilities uh, are given the same opportunities as their non-disabled peers. So Title I has to do with employment. And the EEOC is given responsibility for enforcing Title I of the ADA, which it prohibits private employers, state and local governments, unions, employment agencies, all of those, uh, those areas of employment uh, prohibits them from discriminating against people with disabilities in employment. There are private options uh, for enforcement of all of those uh, all of those areas of government. However, Title I requires a person to allow this this agency, the EEOC Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, to investigate. Uh, before you can enforce it privately. Uh, Department of Justice enforces both Title II and Title III. We're going to talk the most about that, so I'm not going to talk about it in great detail here, uh, but uh, the next few slides will talk about Title II and Title III specifically. The Federal Communications Commission enforces Title IV, and that title uh, requires telephone companies to provide voice transmission relay services that allow people with hearing and speech impairments to communicate over telephone through uh, teletype or typewriters. Uh, in addition, it requires uh, that federally funded television public service messages be closed captioned for viewers so that uh, people with hearing impairments and get the same message. Uh, it is very outdated. Um, other areas of the law have managed to keep up slightly with telecommunications, offering other, um, other more advanced alternatives. Uh, Title IV has not been highly regulated by the FCC, uh, which is something that uh, causes us to be lagging behind in making sure that telecommunications are fully accessible to everyone. Title V covers uh, insurance issues. Uh, it explains the relationship uh, between the ADA and other laws, um, previously existing laws, and it defines explicit restrictions against retaliation or coercion uh, against anyone with a disability who tries to uh, enforce their civil rights under other provisions of the ADA. The ADA is not the only law that uh, that helps try to remedy disparate treatment and ensure full access to uh, to services in life. Um, so it should be noted that the ADA was not the first or the last or the only law uh, that's designed to uh, ensure equal access to all aspects of life. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that's designed to ensure that children have access to special education and related services. Uh, there's the Rehabilitation Act, which, uh, you know, the more famous section of the Rehab Act is Section 504. Uh, that prohibits discrimination by entities who receive federal funding, but lesser known sections of the Rehab Act would include uh, 501, which prevents discrimination in federal sector employment, 
503 concerns uh, discrimination and employment by federal contracts or subcontracts, uh, requirements to engage in affirmative action regarding people with disabilities, and Section 508, uh, which concerns information and communication by federal agencies uh, and requires them to be accessible. There's the Architectural Barriers Act that requires buildings and facilities that uh, use federal funds in their design or their construction uh, or any buildings that are leased by federal agencies. They must comply with the federal standards for our, uh, physical accessibility, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, Telecommunications Act that requires manufacturers of telecommunications equipment and services to ensure that, that equipment and services are accessible to and usable by persons with disabilities. Uh, it requires access to a really broad range of products and services like you know, telephones, cell phones, call waiting, operator services, things that were often inaccessible to many users with disabilities until uh, it was made uh, more accessible. Uh, Fair Housing Act, and so that prohibits uh, housing discrimination on uh, the basis of a lot of things, including disability, but it you know, prohibits discrimination based on race, color, uh, religion, uh, sex, or disability, familial status, and, and even national origin. Uh, it includes not just uh, public, uh, public places, uh, but uh, any place, any type of housing, public or private, that receives any kind of federal financial assistance, uh, but it does also include state and local government housing. And the Air Carrier Access Act, so that prohibits discrimination in air transportation by domestic and foreign air carriers um, uh, with regard to people with either physical or mental impairments. So, you know, to, to say that we are talking about the ADA today uh, doesn't mean that there aren't other parts of other laws that can provide a remedy or are designed to meet some of the needs that the ADA does not, uh, does not help with or, or does not uh, discrimination that the ADA might not prohibit. Uh, these other laws can work in conjunction with the ADA to, uh, in some cases, supplement what's available in the way of a remedy for a violation, and in other ways, it could even supplant it. So let's go back to talking about the ADA. So generally, we see that its protections apply to individuals with disabilities. Now, what does that necessarily mean? So you would have to have a mental or a physical impairment. Uh, and that impairment has to substantially limit one or more major life activity. Now that it's already very broad uh, how to define disabilities. You know, there's a whole, a whole list of uh, major life activities that uh, could be impaired by any number of disabilities. Um, and in the ADA Amendments Act, which happened uh, in 2000, uh, 2010, I believe, um, it actually, no, not 2010, 2008, uh, it expands this definition of uh, who is an individual with a disability and ensures that that is not going to be a question that we get hung up on. You know, we're not gonna litigate whether a person has a disability or not, and whether that substantially limits their major life activity. Um, we need to uh, ensure that if folks uh, can at least um, allege a substantially limiting uh, disability that limits life activities, then we need to go ahead and, and move on to the next part of the ADA. You can also be, you can also have a record of an impairment. Uh, you see this a lot in individuals uh, uh, who might have HIV, 
um, or uh, folks who are regarded as having such an uh, as having an impairment. So you would see that sometimes in uh, cases where individuals might be in remission of cancer. Uh, you know, that's not just a record of having an impairment, but it can be regarded as an impairment. If the discrimination is because of somebody else's uh, perception that you have a substantially limiting disability, then that can cause discrimination. So it's not just whether your disability is limiting uh, your actual major life activity, but having a record of that impairment or other people regarding you as having such an impairment can lead to uh, discrimination, which the ADA is designed to prevent. What type of relief is available? You know, we can just point out that people uh, are discriminating or that uh, they're otherwise not in compliance with the ADA, but what, how do, how do we do that? You know, what is the relief? What is the process? For Title I, uh, you're required to uh, exhaust administrative remedies. That means you have to go to the EEOC and give them the opportunity to investigate. And you have to do that before you as a private citizen uh, can then go and, uh, and enforce it yourself. They can, uh, individuals can get equitable remedies uh, for being treated, uh, uh, for being discriminated against called disparate impact, uh, but they can also get damages, compensatory damages, which are designed to compensate for losses you might have as a result of the discrimination or or treatment and punitive damages are available for when that discrimination is intentional. And that is uh, that's subject to caps that are set. Um, see a question, is bipolar listed as an impairment? Um, I would say that if it substantially limits a major life activity, that's the more important question. Um, so if it, uh, it, there's a whole a whole list of major life activities that can be affected by any any number of disabilities. I would absolutely say that depending on how limiting it is or uh, whether you are regarded by somebody else as having a disability, that's what the question can hinge on. And it's not necessarily is bipolar on the list, but are is an individual with bipolar disorder regarded as having a disability? Um, in the arena of where the, uh, the discrimination uh, is happening. So Title II, <clears throat> uh, this is for states and, and local governments, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. We'll go more in depth. I don't want to, I, I don't want folks to think we're giving it, it short service, but um, Injunctive relief is available. So injunctive relief means that if you are a private citizen, you can go to a court and ask a court to order somebody to fix the problem. Uh, injunctive relief is designed to make another party do something or to prevent another party from doing something. Uh, it's not an award of monetary damages, but it's, it's trying to force an action on the part of another party. Compensatory damages are also available. So if there is a loss or an injury that results in, in the Title II action, then uh, compensatory damages would be available. And again, that's designed to compensate individuals. Uh, Title uh, III, that's for uh, public accommodations, uh, which again, we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, that's injunctive relief only. Um, you can uh, ask a court to order somebody to make a change or, or order somebody to stop doing something, but uh, compensatory damages are not available unless it's ordered by the Attorney General um, who can enforce uh, both this title and Title II. Uh, punitive damages are not available under Title II or Title III, but folks are allowed to get attorney's fees as a result of an action that is successful. 
under either of those titles. So let's go back to talking about Title II and, like I promised, go a little more in depth and see how the ADA is actually applied. So Title II concerns public services. That could be uh, it, any schools, city services, state services. It prohibits discrimination by all public entities at the local level. It could be uh, a school district, uh, a municipality, a city, a county, and it also extends to services that are available at the state level. It covers access to all programs and services that are offered by whatever entity it is. Uh, but it also includes physical access. Uh, that's described in the ADA standards for accessible design. Uh, and uh, as well as programmatic access that might be obstructed by discriminatory policies or procedures that the entity might have. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but uh, Title II applies also to public transportation that's provided by public entities through uh, regulations that are promulgated and enforced by the Department of Transportation. <clears throat> this section requires the provision of paratransit services uh, by public entities that provide fixed route services. So you think of uh, our local city bus system that we have here in Little Rock. Uh, we are, as a result of that, required to have paratransit that is accessible to people with disabilities. It also applies to state and local public housing, uh, as well as housing assistance and housing referrals. So all of those areas having to do with uh, Title II and need to be made accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, another way that it's applied, um, we think of a Supreme Court case of Olmstead versus LC. Uh, that's a case in which clinical assessments that were administered by a state. Um, so again, this is a state service. Those assessments determined that uh, that individuals could be appropriately treated in a community setting rather than in a state institution. Uh, but didn't have that available as an opportunity for them. So uh, this took place in Georgia. So the plaintiffs in that case uh, sued the state of Georgia and the institution for being inappropriately treated and housed in institutional settings rather than being treated in one of the state's community-based treatment options. So the Supreme Court decided that under this title, under Title II of the ADA, that uh, mental illness is a form of disability and covered under the ADA, and that unjustified institutional isolation, uh, which is what it was in this case, uh, is a form of discrimination because, and this is quoted from the Supreme Court, it perpetuates unwarranted assumptions that persons so isolated are incapable or unworthy of participating in community life. And they went on to say that confinement in an institution severely diminishes the everyday life uh, of individuals, including family relations, social contracts, work options, economic independence, educational advancement, and even cultural enrichment. So under Title II, uh, we have carried that forward and no person with a disability can be unjustly excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of services or programs or activities of any public entity. Title III aims to ensure full and equal enjoyment of goods and services, facilities, or accommodations of any place uh, that is open to the public by any person who owns or leases or operates a place of public accommodation. Now, what does that mean? What is public accommodation? That includes uh, places of lodging, uh, like inns or hotels, uh, it includes uh, recreation, 
transportation, education, dining, uh, along with stores, care providers, places of public display. All of those areas are places that are open to the public. Think any, any place that any member of the public can just walk into and, uh, and patronize. Um, those are all types of public accommodations. Um, it includes things like doctor's offices, law offices, um, think places that are private but yet are open to the public. Uh, under Title III, all new construction that is uh, after the date of the ADA, so it was approximately what became effective, I think, July uh, 92, it must be fully compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act accessibility guidelines. Uh, that's found in federal regulations. Um, I will arrange to add the uh, the link uh, to the materials that we have. It's a pretty it's a pretty dense read, um, but they have explainers that are available online that really help uh, really help folks understand it. They have a guide for small businesses, that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, it also it applies to existing facilities as well. So I don't want I don't want you to walk away from this thinking that it's only new constructions. So one of the definitions of discrimination under Title III is a failure to remove architectural barriers in existing facilities. Now this means that even facilities that have not been modified or altered in any way after the ADA was passed still have these obligations to remove barriers. The standard is whether removing barriers um, is readily achievable. And whether something is readily achievable uh, is defined as whether it could be easily accomplished without much difficulty or expense. Now, breaking it down even more, it, it calls for a balancing test. So we can't just set a number and say that something is not going to be difficult or expensive uh, because for what might be expensive or difficult for one business or one public accommodation might be totally uh, unachievable for the other uh, type of business or public accommodation. So you got to have a balancing test between the proposed fix whatever that is, the cost of whatever must be done to achieve compliance and the wherewithal of the business uh, or the owners of the business. This is what, uh, so what might be readily achievable for uh, sophisticated financially capable corporations might not be readily achievable for a small or a local one person business. So, there are there are exceptions to this title so many many clubs and religious organizations uh, may not be bound by title three um, there are some exceptions for historic properties and not just because someone says that it's historic but they have to be properties that are listed or that are eligible for listing in the national register of historic places or properties uh, as historic under either state or local or federal law, uh, they must still comply with the provisions of Title III of the ADA to the maximum extent feasible. So that's an important part of that to remember is that uh, even if a place has historic value, it might still be made accessible. It might still be required to be made accessible uh, only though to the maximum extent that is feasible um, and only with regard to uh, making sure that that place doesn't destroy the historical significance of a feature of the building. So that's the only time that alternative standards can be used for places that are deemed historic. So, you know, there's no such thing as uh, this building existed before the ADA, so we we're grandfathered in. Uh, there's no such thing as um, uh, 
well, the building is really old, so it's it's historic. No, it must actually be eligible because it is a historical property and has historical value that is recognized by the law. And even then, uh, you have to be able to uh, bring it up to the maximum extent feasible to the accessibility standards. Who needs to be accessible? Well, you know, Title III uh, covers public accommodations. Uh, they're required in all of these different places, stores, restaurants, bars, uh, regardless of the size of the business or the age of the building, they are all required to be accessible. Um, we went over this a little bit in the previous slide. Um, local building codes that uh, allow people to not be accessible um, does not create an exemption under the ADA. Uh, and then, you know, also public services, you know, think uh, prosecutor's office, courthouse, um, all of those, uh, all of those places must be accessible. But it's not only architectural access, okay? So when we talk about what accessibility is, you know, your mind might immediately go to, uh, well, they need to have a ramp, they need to have a a door handle that is accessible or uh, automatic doors or uh, accessible parking but it doesn't just it, it doesn't just involve architectural access that's what we call physical access or architectural access um, policies and procedures can have the effect of of making it difficult and, and discriminating against people with disabilities when trying to access goods or services. So not only does the ADA require us as, um, as owners of public accommodation or a provider of public services to be physically accessible, but we must make reasonable modifications to our usual ways of doing things when we are serving people with disabilities. Um, a couple of examples that I have, a daycare that has two scheduled snack times. If you know, if you have a child who uh, who might have diabetes or otherwise have a need uh, to have more than two snack times or have snack times at a modified schedule, well, a daycare is a public accommodation, and under the ADA, not being able to modify that policy would have a discriminatory effect on that individual and being able to. Uh, enjoy the use of that daycare facility. Um, think of a clothing store that only permits one person at a time in a dressing room. Well, if an individual needs to be able to try on clothes but can only do that with the assistance of another person, a reasonable modification of that policy would be to allow them to have an assistant go with them, you know, whether it's a family member uh, or somebody who is uh, who is with them. Uh, as a uh, as a service, like under the waiver, um, that that person should be able to go in and assist them in the dressing room. However, you know, contrary to that, a store would not be required to uh, provide a dressing assistant uh, if it's not offered to everyone, uh, because they would still be able to access that service with an assistant, but because they don't offer that to everybody as an option, they offer trying on clothes in, in a dressing room to everybody, but they don't offer assistance with dressing to everyone. So that has been one way that the, that the DOJ and the Department of Justice uh, has been clear uh, that they would be required to allow an assistant in, but not required to provide that assistant themselves. A really important part of ensuring programmatic access, um, you know, access that's beyond just physical accessibility is ensuring that staff uh, is trained. Um, you have to have staff who are aware of uh, what it means to accommodate or modify uh, uh, services to make sure that folks have access to it. You might have really good policies uh, that are designed to accommodate everybody regardless of what their disability is. But 
if the staff who are the front line uh, are not aware of them or don't know how to implement them, then that is how we see problems arise most often. So businesses really should take the time and the effort to educate their staff about what the ADA requires and uh, they need to understand the, the requirements on modifying their policies and practices, communicating with and assisting customers and accepting, you know, accepting calls through relay systems is a, is a really good example of how uh, we need to modify our way of doing things to make sure that folks with disabilities have access to it. We're going to go back to talking a little bit about accessible design. Uh, this is available online and I'm going to put, I'm going to, if I can, it's not going to let me put the link in the chat, but I will make sure that this is uh, available to you all after the presentation. Um, it is a great resource that's available online. The website itself is just www.ada.gov. Uh, and that's got a lot of, lot of great information on it. Some of it is more technical in nature. Um, thank you for putting that in there. Uh, some of it is really technical in nature. Some of it is really uh, boiled down to uh, make it understandable for folks like small business owners. There's a lot of frequently asked questions that are made available. Uh, but this manual is, is made possible through the Department of Justice. Um, so they are required to, well, they're required by the ADA to supply technical assistance, and this website is their way of making sure that that is implemented. They also have a hotline for technical assistance. Um, they have a plain language FAQ on accessible design. They have one on service animals. They have one on housing. Just a lot of great information. It even provides, you know, pictures uh, in some ways, uh, or for some for some aspects of Title II and Title III. These specific pictures I wanted to bring up because they um, they have come up as of late. So, you know, this is really good to to show that uh, sometimes a business can be in compliance while it's not necessarily the accommodation that an individual might prefer. Um, we had a lot of interest at the start of the pandemic um, around masks at restaurants and requirements for masks preventing individuals with particular disabilities from dining indoors if they can't comply with a, a, a mask requirement. So while those who reached out to us uh, preferred an accommodation of not wearing a mask, one of the, D the ways the DOJ mentioned accommodating an individual is by offering as an alternative a curbside service or delivery. So we can see that um, the Department of Justice in one of its explainers has this, this image with a caption that, you know, when you can't remove a barrier, uh, alternatives can be uh, can make somebody meet this compliance that uh, that they have to have in the ADA. So first picture was an illustration of a restaurant that only had stairs and no ramp, but because they offered curbside service to accommodate an individual who uses a wheelchair, the DOJ uh, says that this is a way of meeting that compliance. And, you know, another note of how things have changed in the other picture, many locations of restaurants we've seen eliminate self-service items uh, due to the pandemic. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that they're out of compliance. The key, uh, the key is whether the service is available to non-disabled consumers as well. And so if, you know, a good question is, is if it's available to everyone, then is it available, is it accessible to everyone? So let's talk a little bit about parking. Okay, um, let me go back and, and look at that picture a little bit. You know, we've got a sign, we've got marked parking, uh, designated parking for um, that is, uh, it purports to be accessible, but we will come back to it after we talk a little bit about it and, and see whether it in fact is. So most common laws regarding parking, obviously the ADA, um, the ADA Amendments Act, uh, 2008, oh, I was right earlier, uh, Fair Housing Amendments Act of 1988, 
Uh, we have state laws that actually affect uh, parking availability in the state. Um, so several of them that I put up on the screen. Um, existing facilities uh, have to uh, offer parking that is uh, designed to be able to give folks access to their services. Um, inaccessible parking keeps you from having that access, right? How can you get to the, uh, how can you get to the service uh, if you can't even get your car there if you use a car? Same with uh, existing facilities uh, in Title III. They have to, again, you know, going back to our language from earlier, they got to remove barriers where it is readily achievable. Um, accessible parking lets you get in the door to even try to get the services. There was a safe harbor provision um, with the new 2010 standards. Um, the new 2010 standards require van accessible parking. So if they were compliant with the 91 standards, they don't have to modify their parking. But if any planned alterations were made, if they restrike their parking lot, for example, then it's got to be brought up to that 2010 standard um, under the ADA. There's a great chart that shows the total number of spaces uh, that uh, a parking lot might have and then the minimum number of accessible parking spaces that would be required for that parking lot. And then again, that's available on ADA.gov. Medical facilities actually require more accessible parking. That might you know, make sense uh, if they have uh, a larger uh, a crowd who is uh, who has disabilities who need accessible parking. It would only make sense. 10% uh, of all patient and visitor parking has to be uh, accessible in hospitals or outpatient buildings. Rehab facilities uh, sometimes require 20% uh, to be accessible. And van accessibility has to be available in one of every six parking spaces. Where must that parking be? It's got to connect to the shortest accessible route to the accessible entrance or to the facility that those uh, those parking spaces serve. If you got multiple uh, buildings or entrances, then they're required to disperse those accessible parking spaces uh, to park near as near as possible to as many accessible entrances as they can. I mean, think of a mall. Uh, if there are separate parking facilities, then you may. Uh, group accessible spaces as long as that number of spaces is determined according to each of the separate parking facilities. So if you think of a stadium that might have uh, multiple different parking facilities, you got to base the number of spaces on the number of uh, that are in each separate facility, not just we have one stadium uh, and so we're going to have one accessible parking lot. Uh, you got multiple parking facilities. You need to have uh, multiple analysis for that. There are exceptions. You know, when you have facilities that are only used for buses or you know, delivery trucks, law enforcement lots, vehicle impounds, the, if those are accessible to the public, then they have to have an accessible passenger loading and unloading zone. But if if a lot is not open to the public and is not a, a public publicly usable lot, uh, it doesn't have to comply in the same way. And you think about it it's because it's it might not be a public accommodation. You know, it might not be a place that's open to the public. And then in that same vein, it might not be a public service to use a lot that is only used by law enforcement. <clears throat> There, it gets really specific uh, with dimensions on how uh, on how wide something can be or how wide it must be. Um, and so, you know, you have visuals that are available in the guide online that show uh, how wide a space needs to be, uh, how wide an access aisle next to it needs to be, um, where you have to have the spaces in conjunction with the building and the sidewalk. Um, Accessible parking spaces have to have specific signage. Um, you know, it's got to be placed in front 
of the parking space. It's got to be at least five feet above the ground. Uh, you got to have van accessible spaces. If you've done any modifications to your parking lot that include, you know, van accessible and they have to be the, the right space for a van, which is larger than the space for another vehicle. Uh, access aisle for accessible vehicles has to be at least five feet and it needs to be as long as the full length of the parking space. Uh, and the space with the car, uh, you know, it has to be eight feet across as opposed to 11 feet for a van. So um, access aisles are really important. You know, if you have folks who are, uh, who might use a ramp to load or unload from their vehicle, then, uh, you know, that access, uh, that access lane uh, can be the difference from, you know, having an accessible space to not having an accessible space. So, you know, I see it. here's another picture that shows an, an access lane that's not accessible, you know, it's cut off. Uh, so if you were to extend a ramp onto that, it, it might dump somebody out into the lane of traffic. And it, it is absolutely not accessible, but it's easily remedied. You know, if you actually have a lane um, that runs the length of the vehicle, then you know, it's it's fairly uh, fairly easy to remedy a violation like that. Uh, we have a question: Can a person with a disability and appropriate signage on their car, uh, not a van, park in a van space if it is the only accessible space? I believe so, but that might be a question. That's going to be a very uh, Arkansas specific question uh, by Arkansas law. Um, and I can provide that answer later on. Spaces must be actually accessible. Um, they got to maintain uh, those spaces in good repair. That means they got to clear stuff like snow and ice and debris, not just from the space, but also from the access aisle. They can't just let it stay there if the business is open to the public. This is just a picture of the signs that we were talking about. Uh, they have to have this special uh, symbol that we saw in the previous slide that is the international symbol of accessibility. The van spaces have to indicate that they're for vans. Um, and the lower edge of the sign uh, must be at least five feet of the, above the ground so that folks can see it before they, um, before they park. We have some exceptions. Uh, residential facilities with parking spaces that are assigned to specific units. Um, would be an exception in small parking lots of four or fewer spaces are exceptions to, uh, now this is just an exception to the signage. They still have to have accessible parking, but uh, the sign can be different in, uh, in those types of parking lots. So we go back to our picture here now that we know a little bit. Um, sign is too low. The parking lot, I don't know that I could tell this from this image, but it says that it's, uh, it's at a slope, which is not acceptable. It's got to be on a flat surface. we got large cracks and ruts and an accessible route, and we don't have an access aisle, so we can't really use that if we use a van with a ramp. So that makes that space, which, you know, at first appearance, if you didn't know, it has a sign. It's it's got the, the symbol on it. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's accessible, but it is not. So the ADA provides the floor, right? It provides the minimum standards. Everybody has to comply with the ADA if it applies to them. But state and local governments can make uh, can make rules that expand what the ADA does. Uh, they can make more stringent rules or more specific rules. Think of issuing parking permits or how they enforce um, parking. Uh, you know, the federal government doesn't uh, police parking permits. Uh, they don't issue uh, placards, accessibility placards. Uh, your state and local governments need to. So uh, state and local governments cannot relax the requirements of the ADA. And this is due to the supremacy clause of the Constitution. Uh, federal laws impact parking in other areas like fair housing that requires reasonable accommodations. Think of apartment complexes who receive uh, 
federal funding um, through housing subsidies, perhaps, they're required to provide reasonable accommodations. Access to Parking for Persons with Disabilities Act. Now, here we are talking about Arkansas law and how Arkansas is um, uh, expanding uh, accessible parking for people with disabilities. So this, this governs the provision of accessible parking spaces for vans. Uh, it's fairly recent, um, you know, just uh, five years ago, um, and then three of the sections weren't effective until just a few years ago. Uh, there are van accessible parking decals now, um, and it authorizes a van to park in a van accessible space. Uh, and their language is not mine for vehicles that transport persons who, quote, have limited or no use of his or her legs, uh, which isn't really uh, the best language to use, but it's what's in the statute, uh, and used to transport a wheelchair, three-wheeled or four-wheeled scooter. Um, those vehicles uh, are able to get van parking decals. So it can be a temporary or permanent tag uh, for a van. Uh, it's got to be verified by a physician. Uh, and then 60% of the use for the vehicle has to be by a person or for a person who qualifies for that decal. So, you know, if you are the owner of a vehicle, but, you know, you only use it 10% 10 per, 10 of the time for somebody with a disability, then uh, you cannot get access to a van decal, or at least you're not supposed to. Um, cannot display a special license plate with a van accessible parking decal um, unless the vehicle is being used for the purpose of transporting a person uh, for whom the decal was issued. So if you're actually using it to, uh, to transport an individual who is eligible for a van, decal, then uh, you would be able to display it. So van spaces are for vehicles with van decals exclusively, unless there's only one space. And that, uh, that I think answers that question. Can a person with a disability and appropriate signage on their car park something other than a van in a van space? Uh, van spaces are for vans with van decals, unless there's only one accessible parking space then, you know, anybody with a decal can park there. Um, you know, your vehicle, the, the new part of the law that only took place a couple of years ago, uh, they only have to do with enforcement of it. it you, you may have your vehicle impounded. There may be fines that are issued. The owner might be fined in some cases. And those fines go towards scholarships for persons with disabilities and increasing public awareness about accessible parking. And this is uh, kind of getting to Dale's question. Hi, Dale. Um, there is a reporting tool. The Arkansas Department of Finance and Administration uh, accepts the uh, uh, complaints. Uh, you can submit pictures and report it to Department of Finance and Administration. That is how Arkansas enforces uh, this uh, this part of the law. You know the the misuse of accessible parking. Outside of that, uh, improper parking on a uh, on a person by person basis, uh, we uh, we won't do people who have not parked appropriately, but if you see a, a spot that is not accessible, I'm going to talk, well, now is as good a time as any to talk about this. Um, when we're talking about enforcement of the ADA, uh, I cannot enforce a parking issue myself. You know, I can submit it to the Department of Finance and Administration, just like just like you did, um, but I cannot file a lawsuit myself uh, to enforce the ADA. Uh, the way that courts have viewed uh, actions under Title II or Title III is that you must individually uh, not be able to access 
that business. So if I am trying to, um, if I am trying to uh, get into a business and I require an accessible spot and they don't have one, um, because I require that accessible spot, I would then be able to enforce it. But uh, we, uh, as folks who just want to uh, make sure that a business is accessible because it's the right thing to do, but we ourselves don't actually need it to be accessible, uh, we cannot enforce that ourselves. Um, so the court's been really clear that um, even when a building is accessible, uh, when that inaccessibility of one area doesn't affect that individual unless it's kept them from being able to access that service, they won't be able to enforce that either. So if you think about an accessible parking spot, that the parking spot uh, might be fine, or even after you, uh, you bring suit to try to enforce it, the owner of the building uh, modifies the space and makes the space accessible, but then you see that, uh, well, the door is also not ac accessible. Well, if they prop the door open, then that hasn't prevented the individual from being able to access the good or service. Um, so courts have been very, uh, very hesitant to, uh, to see beyond this is there an actual injury standard? You know, you still have to be able to show that there is an injury. Um, so if there are individuals who uh, has, uh, have tried to uh, uh, park in a parking spot, but couldn't because there wasn't signage, there wasn't an access aisle, that is certainly enforceable. Um, but if it, if it is just a, a good Samaritan wanting to right the wrong, uh, that enforceability is not there. So let's talk about effective communication. Uh, that's another really important part of the ADA uh, in both Title II and Title III. Uh, I think, I think that we, yeah, I was gonna say, I think that our interpreter froze. Speaking of effective communication, uh, we had to make sure our interpreter was available. So Title II and Title III entities must have effective communication. That means that uh, communication with people with disabilities must be equally effective as communication with people who do not have disabilities. It requires consideration of what is the nature of the conversation? Is it complex? Uh, what is the context of the communication? Uh, and then you also have to consider what is that individual's normal method of communication? So um, think of a restaurant versus a law office. That is something that the Department of Justice uses to illustrate its uh, its position on this. Miss um, Litchfield, you're, would you please mute, or Lainey, can you mute her? Um, restaurant versus law office. Those are, those are uh, uh, examples that the Department of Justice uses to illustrate this point of complexity of the conversation. Um, a restaurant, for example, uh, they might be permitted based on the lack of complexity that's needed to order food. They might be permitted to uh, use picture menus or something similar, uh, whereas a law office might be uh, for very complex uh, uh, communication. They might be about complex issues. It might be very important to ensure that everything is 100% understood by the individual who's receiving that service. So the importance and the complexity of it uh, would push it more towards needing uh, a change of what that effective communication looks like and how important it is to make sure that everything is accurate. The next illustration that they use is a retail store versus a doctor's office. You know, it, if you are just going in for a blood draw, 
then a doctor's office might not need to have complex communication with you and can can accommodate you in a manner of effective communication that uh, might not require something like an in-person interpreter. But if you are uh, uh, learning about test results or needing to explain something to your doctor or your doctor is trying to explain something to you, such as you know options for surgery and risks and benefits and informed consent, depending on what the person needs and how they communicate, that might require a in-person communicator. Almost certainly it would, an in-person interpreter for uh, sign language or some other reason. Whereas a retail store, if you're just trying on clothes, you know, that might not need that relationship that you have with the retail store might not need uh, an interpreter or something more than being able to uh, pass notes or uh, be able to point and look at a catalog, you know, lots of ways to be able to provide that type of communication. Um, you just got to make sure that they are able to access the goods or services that are offered and that the communication is effective enough to relay the needs. So some examples from, uh, from court, you know, and we are here in the Eighth Circuit that controls uh, uh, Arkansas as well as a number of other states uh, have decided a couple of cases um, on effective communication at least. Uh, one of them discussed closed captioning uh, that was offered at a, um, a production of a Broadway show in, it might have been Missouri, uh, and they had a theatrical run, and during that theatrical run, they would only offer one uh, closed captioning production, and it was always during the matinee. Anytime they had a show come to town, they had a matinee in addition to the evening performances and the other weekend performances, but that one show was the only one that had closed captioning, and the court decided that that is just not enough because it is not giving them access to that uh, that public accommodation in that case because it is entertainment and other individuals have many opportunities to go and see the show and here we are uh, we are uh, uh, making individuals who might require closed captioning or an interpreter only one show. Uh, one time in the middle of the day uh, at a matinee, uh, and and that's it. And they said that that wasn't good enough, so they made them provide multiple days that an individual uh, who might require closed captioning, uh, and you can extend that to uh, live interpreters, um, multiple shows to give them an option, just the same as everybody else had available to them. Another case involved a series of meetings with, uh, with a social worker uh, following a disaster that happened in, in one of the states in the Eighth Circuit. Uh, the court, and you know, it's not doing it justice here, but the court um, uh, found that disseminating information to large groups of people, really important complex information about responding to the disaster, uh, definitely required that in-person uh, interpreter services for folks who needed it. Uh, but then subsequent meetings that were smaller, maybe one-on-one -on -one and not complex in nature, uh, but designed to just check in and see how things are going, you know, follow up with a social worker and a person who's uh, going through a natural disaster. Um, those follow-up meetings were not required by the court to have a live in-person interpreter. So responsibility for providing effective communication, that is on uh, the entity uh, that's on the public service, that is on the public accommodation. It is their responsibility to provide effective communication and that means that they have to provide they have to meet the cost of what that effective communication might be they're not allowed to uh, rely on the companion of an individual uh, who needs uh, needs interpreting uh, except in two very limited exceptions 
if it's an emergency that involves an imminent threat to the safety or welfare of an individual or to the public, then they can rely um, on a companion. Uh, and then in situations that might not involve an imminent threat, but if you have an adult who's accompanying someone who uses sign language, they may be relied on to interpret uh, or communicate when the individual wants it. Uh, the adult who is with them agrees and uh, there's reliance uh, on the accompanying adult is it, their reliance on that person is appropriate under the circumstance. And that does not apply to minor children. So if we talk about types of communication, aids or service. Um, the slides will be available. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of information on the next few slides. I mean, just tons of it. Um, it for people who are blind or have vision loss or deaf blind, I'm not gonna read through all of it, but uh, you know, braille, screen readers, qualified readers for people who are deaf, have hearing loss or deaf blind. It might include a note taker. Uh, it might include a, a sign language interpreter. It might include captioning. Any number of ways effective communication might be supplied. Uh, for folks who have speech disabilities, it might include uh, speech to speech transliterators. Um, it could include uh, uh, just taking time to try to understand them. Uh, if that individual uses notes in order to better translate their ideas uh, and the information that they're trying to relay is not complex, uh, you know, you got to go back to our previous question. What is the complexity and the context of the relationship that we have that uh, I might need to try to do something more than just passing notes? Um, more and more uh, ways to accommodate active listening systems. Uh, TTYs are not very commonly used anymore for uh, for telephones, but we have you know video phones, we have captioning, uh, we have again screen readers, and a lot of our electronic documents have a lot of great accessibility features. Things that were once only available in third-party software are sometimes now incorporated into uh, things like um, office products and email services. <clears throat> Gosh, there's so many different types of aids. Real-time captioning. Um, 711 is a free nationwide relay service. Uh, other video relay services, um, free subscriber based service for people who use sign language and have video phones. Video remote interpreting is something that a lot of folks rely on. Um, that might not always be the best way to provide interpreting services, largely because, you know, depending on on where you are, a lot of those VRI systems rely on uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, Wi-Fi internet or cellular internet or some other type of sometimes unreliable transmission uh, of the you know, the sign language interpreting. So, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Shannon. Video relay interpreter systems are used in hospitals, but yes, they can malfunction. And, you know, you have to think about it in the context of what are the facts of of the uh, of the situation that's in front of you right there. Um, can you modify the VRI to be able to uh, let somebody who needs interpreting see the screen? Uh, we had a, a case one time with an individual who was had to be lying down all the time. And so it was very hard for them to see uh, the screen for the VRI. Um, we also have seen folks who uh, the VRI is not dependable or it uh, it's jumpy and that's incredibly hard when you need to watch somebody's hands in order to understand what they're saying or what they're communicating and then vice versa for them to understand you it has to be a pretty clear picture. Who decides what is effective communication and whether it's actually effective? 
Um, you got to give for Title II specifically, they're required to give primary consideration to the person who has that communication disability. And uh, Title II entities, these are our public services. These are state and local governments. Uh, they have to demonstrate that another equally effective means is available or that it's an undue burden or that it fundamentally alters the nature of what the service is in order to provide uh, something other than that person's preference. Title three, not as strong. Uh, these are public accommodations. These are places that are businesses open to the public. Um, they're encouraged to consult with the person who has the communication disability. Uh, limitations, there are limitations for Title II that we just talked briefly about, the financial and administrative burden. Um, the cost has to be considered in light of all the resources available to fund the program or the service or the activity. Uh, it's got to, it needs to be considered uh, in conjunction with the effect of other expenses or operations. And that decision of whether it's an undue burden has to be made by a high level official, uh, no lower than the department head. And it has to give a written statement of the reasons they reach that conclusion. Uh, the limitation of fundamental alteration applies to both Title II and Title III. That's pretty rare. Uh, we see that sometimes in performing arts, uh, slowing down action on stage in order to describe the action for people who, uh, who are blind uh, or who have vision loss that might fundamentally alter the nature of a play or a dance performance. So um, those are, again, that is extremely rare and not, uh, not typically going to be an, an argument uh, to not providing effective communication. Let's talk a little bit about service animals. You know, usually when I do this uh, presentation on the ADA, I lead with the service animals, but the, it has it, it leaves me without much time to go through the things that we've just gone through. And I feel like I've not I've not given a presentation about physical accessibility, and I've not given a presentation about uh, effective communication as often as I have about service animals. Uh, so it's a good time for us to talk about it at the end. Lots of laws impact service animals. We've got not just the ADA, but Section 504, um, the Fair Housing Act or the Fair Housing Amendments Act, uh, the Air Carrier Access Act, the IDEA, and the number of state laws that we have all impact the ability to use a service animal. Those are defined as any dog Service animals, uh, any dog that is individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of an individual with a disability. Um, that can include physical needs, uh, sensory needs, psychiatric, intellectual, or other uh, mental disability that they might have. Um, there are no other animals included in the definition, just dogs, but there's no no breed or size uh, restriction. There's no specific certification that's required. We see lots of times folks who have very official looking papers, and documents and cards that say, yes, this is an official service animal um, that might be great uh, to, uh, to make things easier when visiting a business or a public service to show them a card that looks official, but it is not. Uh, it is not official, um, and the worker task must be disability related. Uh, miniature horses, uh, not technically a service animal, but they uh, they can be included under a reasonable modification category. Uh, so not only, uh, you know, even though service animals are expressly discussed in the regulations, um, then uh, the ADA, remember, still has reasonable modification requirements that uh, a, a miniature horse might be acceptable. Some people might not have 
uh, a service animal because uh, they need something larger like a horse. They might not have one because of allergy reasons. Uh, and they do have much longer lives. They live for 20 to 25 years. Uh, the assessment factors, uh, what is the type and size and weight of the horse and whether the facility can actually accommodate it, uh, whether they have sufficient control and, and whether the animal is housebroken, those are two things that uh, apply to dogs. So they have to, uh, they have to apply to horses as well. Um, and whether uh, there are legitimate safety requirements that would prevent, uh, prevent that animal from being able to help. Lots of different tasks that an animal can perform. You know, we've seen uh, seizure animals um, alerting to the presence of allergies um, or allergens rather. Uh, I've seen somebody use an animal to pull their wheelchair. So we'll talk about some exclusions. So animals that are purely emotional support or companion animals, those are not, um, those are not given protection under the ADA. Okay, so those, uh, you know, you'd have to look elsewhere to other laws and whether uh, it can be accommodated through something other than the ADA by uh, a reasonable accommodation. I know that the Fair Housing Act um, allows people to use uh, emotional service or emotional support animals or companion animals in their home as well as service animals. So uh, that is, uh, it's not covered by the ADA. ADA protects um, service animals. Uh, another exclusion is that, you know, if the animal's not under the control of the handler, um, you know, gets out of control and the handler cannot exercise control uh, over the animal, um, that, uh, that can allow for exclusion of that animal. Uh, if the animal's, you know, not housebroken, uh, that, you know, lots of times leads to not having the animal under control. Um, individuals with disabilities, however, even if they cannot bring their animal, they still have to have access to the service program or activity that's made available. So that's, that's a lot, uh, that's a lot of help, um, even though it might not be the uh, the type of help that the individual uh, wants. So think back to that slide from earlier where we had an individual who was receiving curbside service for uh, an accommodation to not being able to uh, access that restaurant. Now, you know, if the restaurant uh, could feasibly get somebody in there um, using a ramp and make that accessible. Maybe they've gone through that balancing test and found out that it is not feasible. Um, in the same way, the individual with a disability still needs to have access to whatever that good or service is. So uh, the entities are only really allowed to ask two questions about an individual who has a service animal. That is whether the animal is required because of a disability and what work or task has this animal been trained to perform? Okay, they can't ask about what the nature of your disability is. They can't require documentation because remember we just talked about that there is no official documentation. That's not required. So they, they don't need to ask you for any kind of documentation of, of having an official service animal or any documentation showing that they're trained for a specific reason. Uh, there's no ID card, there's no official vest, there's no license for an individual uh, who uses a service animal. And if, if the disability is readily apparent, uh, entities are not even allowed to ask those, those two questions. So think of an individual who is using a guide dog. Um, it might be apparent, it might not be apparent, but it might be apparent. And if it is apparent that that person is using that animal as a guide dog, then you know you don't get to ask any questions at all. Just let them in. Where are they allowed to go? Anywhere a member of the public um, is allowed to go, where program participants who are accessing uh, that service uh, are allowed to go, where patrons or customers, where folks who are there just like you are are allowed to go. 
Uh, if there are legitimate safety concerns, exclusion is allowed. Um, one of the examples they often give is are sterile places like operating rooms or burn units uh, doesn't apply to restaurants or establishments that uh, sell or prepare food. Can't charge you extra fees uh, for bringing your service animal in. Uh, they can charge by they can charge for damage. So you know, don't think that. Uh, if your service animal comes in and, and tears something up that, you know, you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be required to uh, repair that because even though you can bring your service animal in, the owner, the user of the service animal is still responsible for any damage that that animal causes. Um, even if they normally require fees for animals, think of hotels. Um, they need to waive those fees. They need to waive those deposits. Uh, emotional support animal. So that's generally thought of as a type of assistance animal that's not, it's not trained to perform a task or service for an individual. Uh, it might provide comfort or companionship. It might provide motivation. Uh, a number of reasons that an individual can have an emotional support animal, but the key is whether that animal performs a task or a service, uh, but generally emotional support animals are not protected under the ADA, under Title II and Title III. Under Title I, it's not as clear, and I've seen some stuff in the chat um, about e emotional support animals and the EEOC case uh, that has come up. Um, EEOC has, uh, they've tried to, uh, uh, allow emotional support animals protection under Title I. Um, I would say that it is a it it, it is uh, it is going to be hard to uh, to enforce uh, emotional support animals uh, under Title I. Uh, and remember that that applies to employment situations. Um, Uh, we talked about this already. Moving on. Uh, so we can go back a little bit to uh, um, Section 504 of the Rehab Act, because it has an impact on, and we just have a few minutes left, so it does have an impact on service animals. Um, it applies to federal governments. Uh, federal government facilities, activities, and programs uh, to recipients of federal funding. Uh, it could apply in a school setting if an animal is not allowed, then it could, in cases where it does deny a student an opportunity to participate in and benefit from an educational program. Again, it's a very fact-specific question. Uh, it could apply in public or subsidized housing. Um, Section 504 doesn't define service animals, so it is possible to have broader coverage that you see under the ADA, but it is not explicit. Fair Housing Amendments Act applies to almost all housing, and this is where we see probably some of the most protections for uh, uh, folks with uh, assistance animals or emotional support animals. It applies to almost all housing. Um, whether they receive subsidies or not, uh, they have to make reasonable accommodations that includes for individuals who use assistance animals. So it's not specific uh, that it only applies to service animals. Um, ga uh, guidance from the housing, uh, housing and Urban Development says that an assistance animal works, provides assistance, or performs a task for the benefit of a person with a disability, or provides emotional support that alleviates one or more identified symptoms or effects of a person's disability. So while it's not defined specifically for emotional support animals or service animals in the Fair Housing Act, uh, the entity that regulates that, uh, Housing and Urban Development, they consider it to extend to uh, people who use uh, emotional support animals or assistance animals. All right, we've got five minutes left. What if a person has PTSD due to a dog attack and a classmate has and is able to use the service dog inside the same room in a college, I'm assuming in a dorm? So that, um, 
that would require an accommodation of a different type. You know, we've we've had uh, I, I've had discussions hypothetically with uh, uh, folks from the Department of, uh, of Education Office of Civil Rights about uh, cases where you do have service animal on the one hand uh, and you have allergies on the other. And it was a very specific issue of an individual. It wasn't in our state, but it was a very specific uh, issue of an individual who had very severe dog allergies um, in a class. This wasn't in a dorm, but it was in a class uh, with another individual who legitimately required the use of a service animal in school. It was something that the school couldn't otherwise accommodate. And uh, we went round and round discussing uh, who, who I hate to say who wins because nobody wins in, in that scenario, but who is given preference, uh, the individual who needs a service animal or the individual who has um, disabilities that uh, are triggered by uh, that dog allergy. And he came to the conclusion that the, there is specific guidance on service animals. There is specific regulations dealing with service animals that permit them to enter. And so the school, in this case, would have to be required to not only let the child use the service animal, but then to turn around and have to accommodate the individual with the allergy, uh, because you couldn't accommodate, you needed to accommodate both of them because there was no other way around it. Uh, so allergies, I, I would think that uh, uh, a dog attack would allow that person to have an accommodation uh, because of their PTSD to uh, somehow seek something other than sharing the room with the individual who has the dog, if that's what they need in order to be accommodated. Uh, but, you know, looking at what OCR, uh, Office of Civil Rights position was in that hypothetical that he gave me, um, in that case, the service animal might be given preference depending on who is enforcing it in what, uh, in what uh, forum. Uh, how can day programs in Arkansas refuse to take adults with uh, adults with individuals out into the community? Um, isn't this considered a form of institutionalization? Is it a violation of the Olmstead Act? The day program in Arkansas are also separating those with autism away from others with differing special needs. Who is supposed to be enforcing this? These are all really good questions. Um, you know, the Department of Justice enforces uh, Title II uh, and, and Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, it reaches into other areas like, uh, you know, if it's a violation of Medicaid, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, they have an Office of Civil Rights. Um, depending on what type of program it is, if it's Section 504, that goes back to uh, the Department of Education, uh, but, you know, it, it can be a form of institutionalization if they're not getting services in the community. Uh, the question is whether uh, it is unjustifiably so and uh, the choice of the individual. Um, what protective acts are in place for medically complex children that cannot uh, speak or protect themselves from their classmates that have violent out? bursts. Uh, protections for folks who cannot speak or protect themselves. So, you know, there's several protections. It depends on what the setting is. Since you say classmates, I'm assuming that it's school. If it's medically complex and they cannot speak because of a disability, you know, ADA uh, is definitely a, a place where you can uh, uh, get assistance. The IDEA, uh, if your child has uh, has a disability and might be identified for special education and related services. And that's a whole other presentation in its entirety. Uh, but there's a lot of remedies that might be available to you um, in order to make sure that that child is protected. But that is all the time that we have, Lainey. Thank yeah, you, thank you guys so much for all the great questions. Um, as Thomas pointed out, he has a lot more information in his actual, like in his slides, and we'll make sure those go out as well. Um, after this is done, I'll get the, the video and the slides sent out to all the attendees. Um, thank you, Thomas, for a, another great presentation. Um, 
we I do want to ask that you take the short survey here at the end of this session, um, as well as you can check out previously recorded webinars on our website as well, and I'll send that link out. Thank you again. Um, make sure you continue celebrating the 32nd anniversary of the ADA. You can check out our social media for some more information on that. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your day.